Okay. So today uh, we are going to start my favorite topic, which is dynamic optimization problem. Okay, so this is what I do for a living, dynamic optimization. Uh, and that's like 95% of my research. Um, so the goal here is to first go over some of the intricate points in dynamic optimization. And then uh, we'll talk about algorithms starting from the next class. Okay, so dynamic optimization. So what's a dynamic system. So this room is a dynamic system and there are a few things that happens in the room. So we want, we as human beings, we want the temperature in this room to be a comfortable temperature. And what is a comfortable temperature? Well, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, let's say, plus minus epsilon. So we want the temperature of this room to be around 72 degrees Fahrenheit and I have a sensor here and that sensor senses the temperature of the room and then it figures out how much, what volume of, what's the volume of cold air that needs to be pumped in this room or hot air that needs to be pumped into this room so that the temperature is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And this is a closed loop system, closed loop system in the sense that the temperature of the room changes, the temperature sensor senses what's happening, what the temperature of the room is, and then it sends some command to an air handling unit, which is in the, which is above the ceiling, and that air handling unit determines how much cold air or how much hot air needs to be pumped inside this room, okay? And this kind of situation or this kind of system is known as dynamic optimization, uh, it's a dynamic system, and the optimization comes in because you want to maintain a comfortable temperature while minimizing some cost. What would be the cost for cooling down or heating up this room? It's typically going to be the cost of electricity, right? If assuming that electricity is what is being used to heat or cool this building, it's the cost of electricity. It could be carbon emissions of the building. It could be uh, some other notion of cost, comfort, Okay, so something minus 72, the temperature minus 72 absolute value, or it could be square of temperature minus 72 degrees Fahrenheit square. So you could have, you could come up with different types of cost and you want to minimize the cost while satisfying the dynamics of the system. So typically, the dynamical equation for the room would be specified by this by this particular uh, equation. So xt plus one equals to ft, which is called the state transition function. Okay. So Ft is state transition function, Xt is known as the state of the system, and Ut is said to be the action of the system. So you have state action and then a state transition function. And T is of course time. time index. Questions? No? So if you look at this particular room, what is the state of the room? Well, the state of the room is temperature, okay? The temperature sensor is reading the temperature of the room. 
that's the state of the system what is the action of the system well the action of the system is what's the cubic cubic feet per minute airflow of cold or hot air i think it's going to be hot air right now there's no way for me to sense i'm i'm assuming that it's going to be hot air so the ut is what is the cubic cubic feet per minute flow that is being pumped into this room okay that's action of the system and then there is this time index so there is current time and then there is 5 minutes later so right now it's 155 pm so so t is the current time is 155 pm then t plus 1 would be uh, 2 pm and then t plus 2 is going to be 2 pm 205 pm and t plus 2 is going to be 2010 pm and so on and so forth okay so that's the time index xt is the current state xt plus 1 is the future state and the future state which is the future temperature of the room depends on the current temperature of the room the cubic feet per minute of air flow into the room and some state transition function that computes what the new temperature of the room is going to be based on the current temperature and how much heat or heat was added to the system or how much heat was rejected from the system now in this class i am not going to tell you how to come up with ft okay so typically this ft is something that you will learn what this what the value what the function form of the ft is you will learn it in your physics class or chemistry class or biology class whatever class you want to take okay so you could have a battery pack and the battery will have a state of charge so my cell phone has a state of charge right now it's 74% ut is how much battery am i using so if i'm running if i'm gaming or if i'm watching youtube videos i'm draining the battery much faster on the other hand if i'm not doing anything which thankfully right now i'm not doing anything with my phone uh the ut is actually very small and therefore the state will not trans like the 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 battery at the next uh, after 5 minutes is going to be very similar to the state of charge at this minute so in the case of battery this xt is the state of charge ut is what exactly am i doing with that battery and the same thing happens in electric vehicles as well um where xt would be the state of charge of the entire battery pack and ut is how fast you are driving are you driving on a highway are you parked near the side of the road or or are you driving within a city traffic with a lot of stop and go traffic okay so depending on that the new state of charge would get determined based on the current state of charge and what kind of actions you are taking uh in that system okay so are these three uh, are these notions clear what the state transition function is comes typically from the physics chemistry or biology of the system uh why do i say biology so you can look at the population of i don't know fox in yellowstone so that's your xt population of fox ut is what actions you are taking as a i don't know as a park ranger what actions you are taking and then the num the the population of fox at the next next time step which is probably the next year is going to depend on the current population of fox and what actions have been taken by the rangers and so on so in that case the biology of the system gets determines what this ft is going to look like um so so insulin pumps xt is the the uh, volume of glucose in my blood stream at this point of time ut is what my pancreas are doing at this moment right so it may be secreting some uh, uh, insulin into my blood stream okay so that's determined by ut that's what my pancreas are doing and that determines my blood glucose level at the next time step the notion of time index is is very important so and it really depends on from one application to another so if i'm looking at the temperature of the room i would prefer that t to t plus 1 so one time step be 5 minutes long if i'm looking at my blood glucose level i i'm assuming that this one time step would be like 1 hour long 
If I'm looking at population of fox in Yellowstone National Park, this one time step could be six months or one year. And if I'm looking at uh, the wireless network, which is figuring out you know, uh, how to route the traffic, how to route the requests from each of your mobile device, one time step is of the order of nanoseconds or microseconds. Okay? So depending on the application, this one time step is very small or it could be very large. Autonomous vehicles, if you want to get into autonomous vehicles business, the one time step is going to be of the order of 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds. Okay? So you want to make a decision every 50 milliseconds about what to do next or every 100 milliseconds about what to do next. So it really depends on the application that you are looking at. So this is the dynamical equation. Now the next thing comes, cost function. So when you have a dynamic system, you have a dynamic cost function, and it's given by J of U1 to U capital T. So let me say T goes from 1 to capital T. This is known as the running cost. This is known as the terminal cost. Now cost depends again on the application that you are trying to solve. Typically, uh, in, in most of the controls problem that, uh, that I have studied, this is typically the cost of energy or the carbon emissions or the um, uh, tracking cost. Tracking cost is CT of XT UT equals to uh, xt minus x bar t square plus ut transpose r ut. So this is typically the tracking cost. This is the, this is the track, uh, the state you want to track, the trajectory. Okay, so if I'm, uh, I'm driving an autonomous, no, I, I cannot be driving an autonomous vehicle. But if I'm driving a vehicle, uh, XT is my current GPS position, X bar T is the center of the lane, the GPS position of the center of the lane. And I want my GPS position to be as close to the center of the lane as possible. So I want to minimize the square, but I also want to minimize the effort needed to get my car to the center of the lane. In other words, I don't want to have too many zigzag motions. I just want to drive um, smoothly. So this is the smoothness parameter. I'm, I want to drive smoothly, but I want to be close to the center of the lane, as close to the center of the lane as possible. So this is known as tracking problem, and it's very widely used in a lot of process control problems, where you want to track a specific trajectory, state trajectory, while exerting as little effort as possible. And that's usually uh, measured through this U transpose RU variable. You could have a problem where there is no running cost, 
but there is only terminal cost. So for instance, I want to send a rocket from Earth to the moon, and all I care about that the rocket reaches the moon. I don't care how much time it takes. I don't care what the running cost is. I just want to land this particular rocket to the moon. So then I only have a terminal cost, which is I want the final state of the rocket to be on the moon, OK? And I don't care about the running cost. Of course, that's not how you fly the rocket. You do worry about running cost because you want to get there with as with, with the minimum amount of fuel as possible. So you do want to get to the moon, but you don't want to spend a lot of fuel trying to get to the moon. Okay, So there are, of course, uh, very sophisticated optimization problems that all these SpaceX vehicles are solving every, every few milliseconds in order to get to the, well, SpaceX rockets are not going to the moon, but they are going to the orbit, and they are solving problems of this type every few milliseconds to get to the final orbit that they want to get to. OK, so very, very uh, useful framework for a lot of different applications, wherever you want to minimize some cost. Now, <clears throat> one thing you will notice is I've written the total cost, J, which is the total cost as a function of sequence of actions that I have to take, OK? So the total cost depends not just on the final action, but on all the, the entire sequence of actions that you have taken until the terminal time step. Now here is the problem. I want an algorithm to compute the optimal sequence of actions that minimizes this total cost but satisfies this dynamical equation. Okay? I want to minimize the total cost of electricity that is used for cooling or heating up this room while maintaining the dynamical constraint of the thermodynamics of the room. Okay? Or I want to send the rocket to the moon with minimum amount of fuel while satisfying the equations of motions of the rocket, okay, which is a six degrees of freedom body. So, so you want to make sure that that equation of motion is satisfied at every point of time. And that's the problem we want to solve in the, for the rest of the semester. How do we compute? How do we minimize this cost? for that particular dynamical system. <clears throat> okay. Now there are generally two notions of what is known as control policies. And I want to talk about those policies. Any questions so far on this? No? Okay. So let's talk about policies. The one is open loop. Policy. And the second is closed loop policy. So open loop policy is defined as the policy where you pick a sequence of actions and you don't care about what state you are in. Okay, you just you have picked an action at the beginning of time. This is going to be my U1, this is going to be my U2, this is going to be my U3, and so on. And, and that's it. Once you have decided, you are just going to execute that sequence of actions. That's open loop policy. Closed loop policy, on the other hand, says that UT should be a function of XT. And this is the closed loop policy. Gamma t is a closed loop policy. Okay. 
Okay. So in open loop policy, I don't look at the state. I, I probably I just look at the initial state, but I don't look at the state in the intermediate time step. I have a sequence of actions and I'm going to just execute the sequence of actions as it is. So if I want to go home, my sequence of actions would be drive 100 meters, take a left turn, drive 100 meters, take a right turn, drive 100 meters, take a left turn, and so on and so forth. Right? That's an open loop policy. Is that a good policy? So the question is, consider these two policies. So one is closed loop policy, where I look at the current state, and then I make my decision according to some map gamma t, which is known as the policy, closed loop policy. In open loop policy, I look at the initial state that, okay, I'm in the university and I need to get home, right? So that's my cost function. I want to get home. And I come up with a sequence of open loop policy. I don't look at the state and I just drive, okay? I just drive. Drive at 40 miles per hour for two seconds, take a right turn, drive at 40 miles per hour for five seconds, take a left turn, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you would agree that open loop policy is not a good policy. I have to look at what's happening on the road. If there is a traffic jam, I cannot really drive at 40 miles an hour. Okay? Or if there is a kid playing on the road, I cannot drive at 40 miles an hour, even if there is no traffic jam. So in some sense, you would agree that when you are driving, I always need to make sure that I understand or I, I observe what the state of the system is. What's the sensor I use for observing the state of the system? I use my eyes. My eyes are the sensors which measures. Well, not just my eyes. My eyes captures the image. My brain processes that image and tells me what the XT of the system is, whether there's a traffic jam or not, whether there's a red light or a green light or not, and so on and so forth. And then I have some rule in my head, gamma t, which tells me, okay, how much steering should I do, uh, how much steering should I rotate by, and how much acceleration or brake I should apply on the vehicle, and that's gamma t. That gamma t is a policy that maps the state to the action, and then, of course, my hands and legs execute that action on the vehicle, and the vehicle moves forward. So in most of the systems, we want to have closed loop policy. We would like to have. We want to observe the current state of the system, and based on the current state, we want to take an action. This is what we would like to do. So, what would be the catch for having a closed loop policy in system? What's the catch for, like, if, if this is what we want? Why would we even study the open loop policy? What do you think? What, what, what's the answer to that question? Sorry? Right. So there are a few problems. The first thing is, in open loop policy, you just have to compute a sequence of actions. So it's much easier to compute that in comparison to computing a closed loop policy where I have to compute functions, okay? where I have to come up with functions. And the more important problem is, even if you come up with functions, how are you going to store in the computer? Okay? So, gamma t is a function that maps xt to ut. Now, there are, of course, simple functions like x square. I can store it very easily. I can write a code which computes x square. Or I could. If it is log of x, again, something that's very easy to compute. But if it is a, a more complicated function, so for instance, I want to look at what's happening on the road, and based on that information, I want to execute a sequence of commands on, the, on my vehicle, that's a very complicated policy, and how are you going to store that policy in the vehicle, okay? So closed loop policy has a lot of problems, both with computation, which is which requires far more computational resources, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. And also storage, because you just don't have to compute it, you also have to store the policies on the computer of the system, on the system, and that is a very, very difficult problem. 
If you have taken EC3551, how many of you have taken EC3551 feedback control systems, maybe in your undergrad or, okay, some of you have taken. So in EC3551, what you do is you come up with simple gamma T, not complicated gamma T that we are talking about here, but simple gamma T known as PID controllers or a lead lag controllers, which looks at the state and that det then determines what action needs to be taken. So that's lead lag compensators and, uh, and PID, PID controllers. That's simple gamma T, okay? That's old gamma T of 1970s. The gamma T of 2020s are far more complex, like driving an autonomous vehicle. You can't just apply a PID controller and expect it to work, okay? So in 2021, we want to have a better understanding of how to compute optimal policies and how to store optimal policies in a much more effective and, and uh, fast way. So these are the things that we will be discussing for the rest of the semester um, until the class ends. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's look at, uh, let's set up the optimization problem. The two optimization problems. One where I want to find the optimal open loop policy and one where I want to find optimal closed loop policy. I want to minimize over U1 to U capital T of J of U1 to U capital T such that X2 equals to F1, X1, U1. What kind of problem does this look like? I want to minimize a function j, which is a function of u1 all the way up to ut, subject to the dynamical equation of the system, which seems to be appearing as constraints in the optimization problem, right? So it turns out there are two ways to look at optimal open loop, uh, like computation of optimal open loop policies. One way is to view it as a constraint optimization problem where you are minimizing over all u1 to ut and x2 to xt plus one <coughs> subject to these constraints. The alternate way of looking at it is I can eliminate, notice that these are all equality constraints. What have we learned so far in optimization? If there's one thing we have learned and we have used time and again in optimization, whenever we have equality constraints, we can always eliminate those equality constraints and create a problem where there are no equality constraints. You did that in your electricity market example in assignment three, right? So there are two ways by which you can solve this problem. One is you view it as a constrained optimization problem and then apply Lagrange multiplier theorem to solve this problem. Or alternatively, you eliminate all these equality constraints 
and convert this into a static optimization problem and just solve the static optimization problem. And we'll look at, we'll look at uh, the two ways to solve this problem in the subsequent classes. When you're solving for open close, optimal closed loop policies, things are a bit more difficult because when you want to get closed loop policies, you're not looking for optimal U, you're looking for optimal gamma, okay? So here, I'm going to write minimum over gamma one to gamma capital T, J of gamma one to gamma capital T, which is equal to summation CT of And of course, this is subject to xt plus one equals to ft xt ut. So I rewrite the cost function as a function of gamma, okay, where I replace all the ut with gamma t xt probably I should also replace here gamma t x t. So I've replaced all u t by gamma t x t and I want to minimize over all gammas, over all closed loop policies. Okay, so in this problem, it appears very difficult and it is actually very difficult because now you are minimizing a function that depends on other functions and you have a very complicated set of equations that you need to solve in order to compute the optimal solution for the closed loop policies. Okay, so here are the main theoretical tools that we will study. This part, optimal open loop policies, we are going to talk about Pontryagin. Minimum principle. Sometimes people call it maximum, so if you have a, instead of a cost, if you have profit or if you have reward, then you use maximum principle. If you have a cost, then you use a minimum principle. And for computing the optimal closed loop policies, the theoretical framework is dynamic programming. I should mention this is 1948-ish, and this is 1949-52-ish. to So fairly old um, theory. I must also add that this theory was very crucial for the Apollo missions, which put man on the moon for the first time. So if we didn't have Pontryagin minimum principle, it is unclear whether uh, man would have reached the moon or not. Okay, so this is very, very important. This was too complicated at that point of time but now with so much of computation, like cheap computation and 
uh, you know, you have GPUs that you can put in the trunk of your vehicle. Uh, it is more appropriate for today's world to apply dynamic programming. Uh, but in 1950s and 60s, the computers weren't powerful enough, and so they could only apply optimization algorithms to find optimal open loop policies. And the way you implement optimal open loop policies in an actual dynamic system is you compute the optimal sequence of actions every few milliseconds or every few seconds. And that's how you, you sort of track the optimal trajectory. But there are some serious robustness issues with this kind of algorithm, which can be alleviated with dynamic programming based algorithm. And we'll study a lot of those topics in, in the rest of the semester. OK. So let's talk about Pontryagin minimum principle. The reason, again, you will see it written as maximum principle when you have maximization problem here. But because we have a cost, we are minimizing the cost. So I'm writing it as minimum principle. But they are used interchangeably. OK. Oh, another uh, cool fact. This was developed in USSR post-World War II. And this was developed in US post-World War II. And the primary reason for development of these tools or techniques, as I have heard, I'm not a historian, but what I have heard is because of the rocket propulsion. They wanted to be able to hit the enemy on the other side, so to say, and that's why they developed these optimization techniques to enable that technology in that era. And, and certainly, like they have been used for, for rockets for quite some time and were crucial for Apollo mission. So, um, so they are actually very important. <clears throat> OK, so let's talk about Pontryagin minimum principle. So the key tool I'm going to use now is I'm going to eliminate all these equality constraints. OK? So I know that x2 is a function of x1 and u1, and I'm just going to write it as phi1 of u1. of u1, u2, to ut, where, of course, the rest of the term doesn't really affect the value of, of output of the function. My x3 is a function of x2 and u2, and I can write it as follows. So now it becomes a function of u1 and u2. And I'm going to give it a name phi2 of u1 to ut. And I can continue this process. And I can get x capital T plus 1. phi t plus 1, which takes as input u1 to u capital T.
what have I done? I have written each of the state x2, x3 all the way up to xt plus 1 purely as a function of u1 all the way up to ut, u1 all the way up to ut, and so on. Now I can write uh, you know what, I'm going to define a vector u vector, which is basically stacking all the u1 to ut uh, as a vector. And then I'm going to say j of u is c capital T plus 1 C capital T Okay. I think I'm going to change a small thing here. So I'm going to make it phi 2, phi 3, and then it's phi t plus 1 is correct. Okay. So x3 equals to phi 3 of u, x2 equals to phi 2 of u. There's no phi 1 in this particular example. So then I can write it as phi t of u, comma ut. t goes from 1 to capital T. And this is the problem I want to solve. I want to compute the optimal u vector star. Any questions? Okay, so I have a dynamic system which means I have a bunch of constraints in my optimization problem. Um, I have, what I have done is, I have tried to remove all the constraints using these functions phi of t, which takes as input the sequence of action and tells you what the state at every time is going to be. Then I rewrite the optimization problem through appropriate substitution, I rewrite the optimization problem now there are no constraints in this problem, okay? There are no constraints in this problem, so what's the necessary condition for optimality? This is an unconstrained problem now, okay? There are no constraints. What's the first order necessary condition for optimality? gradient of u vector of j of u vector at optimal solution must be equal to zero. Yes, please. This is only if the problem is complex. Uh, this one, first order necessary condition, it doesn't matter whether j is convex or not. This is true regardless. Uh, of course, if j is convex, then this is also a sufficient condition for optimality. But, but here, we are not making any assumptions on j right now. Okay? So I want to compute u star. I can run gradient descent algorithm to compute a point that satisfies first order necessary conditions for optimality. 
In order to run gradient descent, what do we need? We need to be able to compute gradient of u of j. Okay. Now, if I look at this expression and I have to compute the gradient, it seems like a very complicated task, right? But we are going to come up with a simple way of computing this gradient so that we can run gradient descent algorithm and be able to minimize this j of u. So let's look into that problem. How do I compute this gradient of u of j in order to run gradient descent algorithm? So the gradient descent algorithm would be u vector k plus 1, u vector k minus alpha k in order to run this gradient descent I need this I need to be able to compute this uh, this vector this derivative so that's our goal Okay. I, I think that this problem is very difficult. Uh, I mean, you know, there are all these different fees, and then there is C, CT, and then there is CT plus one. It's very complicated. Uh, I, I can't do such uh, complicated stuff. So I need to do something simpler. How can I simplify the problem so that I can at least uh, start solving this problem. I want some, some way to simplify the problem further. Do you have any thoughts? How do I simplify this further? This is just too complicated. Too many fees, too many Cs. I'll get entangled in a lot of equations. Can I make some assumptions and proceed so that my life is easier? Sorry? Calculate for the first time step. Yeah, I think uh, not a bad idea. But you know, my gradient at the first time step depends on what's going to happen in the future as well. So I guess I can't really apply that. Because u1, my u1 affects x2, x3, x4, x5, all the way up to x capital T. So it creates a problem. It's still complicated. So here is what I'm going to assume in the beginning. So step one, assume that my CT is equal to zero. My running cost is zero. I'm just going to kill. So as soon as I kill CT, I have killed all of these FETs as well. I don't need. Uh, to worry about FETs, at least in the, in order to compute the derivative. All I have to worry about is derivative of CT plus 1 composition FET plus 1. Okay, so my running cost is 0, so gradient of U of J is the same as gradient of U of CT plus 1 composition Pt plus 1 of u. What does the chain rule of differentiation say? Let me put this in brackets. So 
So now I have a function composition, another function, and I want to take the derivative. This is exactly equal to phi t plus 1 times gradient of x t plus 1 c t plus 1. Okay. So now if I want to come, so this one is easy to compute. I know exactly what ct plus 1 looks like. I can compute the derivative of ct plus 1 with respect to xt plus 1. So this part is easy. This is by the way chain rule. Uh, this was maybe lecture 2 or 3. I don't know which lecture it was, but in 2 or 3 I talked about chain rule for differentiation. So using the chain rule, this part is easy to compute. This is the only part that's creating a problem for me. OK? Now let me write phi t plus 1. So I can write this gradient as a stacked gradient with respect to individual actions of phi t plus 1. Okay. So this is more manageable now. Now let's look at This is the same as gradient of ut of ft of xt ut, right? I'm just substituting phi t plus 1's value here. Does xt depend on ut? So remember, I'm taking derivative with respect to ut, and I have two arguments here. So I have to worry about whether this argument depends on this variable or not, and whether this argument depends on this variable or not. I mean, obviously, ut depends on ut. I mean, that's, that's so obvious. The non-obvious thing is, does xt depend on ut or not? No. Why, why does it not depend on ut? No, it has nothing to do with open loop. OK, let's look at what xt is. ft of xt minus 1, ut minus 1. What is xt minus 1? ft minus 2, ut minus 2, and so on. Right? So. None of these terms, xt minus 1, xt minus 2, and so on, none of those terms are influenced by ut, because ut is your terminal action. ut is what you take at the final time step. So xt is independent of ut. So this is the derivative of the, so the gradient of phi t plus 1 with respect to ut is exactly equal to this particular expression, because xt doesn't depend on ut at all. Okay. Any question? Yes, please. So if it was like x t plus one, then it would depend on u t. X t plus one, yes, because x t plus one equals to f t x t u t, right? So x t doesn't depend on u t, but x t plus one depends on u t for sure. <clears throat> okay.
Okay. So that's all I have for today. In the next class, I'm going to look at, so we have already computed the final term in this vector, but I need to compute some of these terms going all the way up to phi of u1 phi t plus 1. So we'll come up with a recursive equation to compute these derivatives. And then I'm going to extend in step two, I'm going to extend this entire formulation to the one with running cost. Okay, and we'll get what is known as back propagation algorithm for computing optimal solution in a dynamic optimization problem. And that algorithm, back propagation algorithm, is the same algorithm that is used for training neural networks. It's the same algorithm. And so the derivation of back propagation algorithm is part of your assignment six. So that's all I have. Thank you, and I'll see you guys on Friday. <clears throat>